redeemed in the dynamic name of Jesus Christ. It's always good to be in the house of the Lord. God is good all the time. All the time. Hallelujah. Do you dare to believe that God is on the throne? Do you dare to believe that God and His Word are the same? You are saved by the Word of God. And you are healed by the Word of God. If God was here today and He said, be healed, would you believe it? Well, God and His Word are the same. And you can be healed by the Word of God. You've got to believe it. You've got to receive it. You've got to receive it in your heart. The rainbow Word. And we know that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And if God be for you, who can be against you? And we are more than conquerors to them that loved us. And so we need to think, what is it that God has done for us that we just can't understand? And that's God's love. We don't comprehend God's perfect love. That perfect love. But it tells us in Romans 8, 37 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, nor depth, nor height, nor any created thing can separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. For our mothers, grandmothers, uncles and aunts, put things in perspective. You have a baby. The baby's one day old, up to six months. And you look at that baby, and you look at that baby's eyes, and then you say to yourself, I never thought I could love anyone this much. I never thought I could have that much love in me to love this baby that much. And that's the kind of love that God has for you, but multiplied a million times, a million times. And then we know that God's peace just pass over you, that perfect peace that's beyond all comprehension. Do you have that perfect peace when your son or your daughter, a relative, a loved one, goes to the hospital? Do you have perfect peace? You say, God, I want them to be here, but if you want to take them home, so be it. I had that perfect peace. But then if you do, then God's peace for you is beyond that, a thousand times more. And we're going to find about that one day. I, read, uh, I saw a clip a couple of days ago about a young man. 11 years of age, and unfortunately, he was lifting a swimming pool and he drowned. And they took him to the hospital, and uh, he was dead for 45 minutes. They brought him back to life, and uh, they said he'll never be the same because he, he was dead for 45 minutes. But when he came back to life, he was very articulate, he was very alert, and he could communicate very effectively, and he was okay. He could do everything that little boys could do. Unfortunately, three years later, he did go to heaven because his lungs had been incapacitated through that, that experience where he died for 45 minutes. But then his mother recounted his story, and she said that he went and met Jesus. He said that Jesus went up to him, and Jesus took him by his hand, and he said, come with me. And all of a sudden, he said he was moving through the galaxies, through the stars, and he was going through galaxies and galaxies and stars upon stars and sparks, and it was like in a moment, and then all of a sudden, he arrived at a golden city, a city of gold, where the streets were gold, and the colors were magnificent. They were just out of this world, and the sound and the aromas were just all beautiful, and the people were there, and the love was there, and he just felt so much love. He said, oh, this is heaven. I never want to go back to home, you know. This is love. And then he saw babies and babies and babies and millions of babies, probably the aborted babies. And then God, Jesus told him, you're going to have to go back. He goes, well, what's happening with my family? He goes, your, your brother's going to go in the military, and there's going to be a great war called World War III. And then what about my mother? He says, she's going to be caught up in the awakening and the catching and the rapture. And then after that, there's going to be a great tribulation. So the question is, are you ready? Are you ready to meet Jesus? Do you have Jesus in your heart? Because we know that Jesus died for our sins. And Romans tells us that if you believe in your heart that God died for your sins, you should be saved. So we're going to do that right now. And those people out in Periscope, right there in TV land, I want you to repeat this prayer. So I want everybody to repeat this prayer. Dear Jesus, thank you for coming to earth and dying for my sins. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he was crucified, buried, and rose on the third day. Dear Jesus, forgive me of all of my sins. Come into my heart and be Lord of my life. Amen. If you said that prayer in TV land, we believe that you're born again, that you're saved. And if you were to die today and stand before God and God would say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? You will say, because I accepted Jesus Christ 
right on TV land at Calvary Assembly of God Church in El Monte. And so what is the key to moving to that new dimension? What is that key to move to that higher level? And the key is in the Word of God because we say in Psalms 1, Blessed is a man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But in his delight, he meditates on the word of God day and night. And he should be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth fruit in his season, and his leaves shall not wither. And whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. They are like the shaft which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment nor the sinner in the congregation of the righteous. But the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the sinner shall perish. Meditate on the word of God. So I'll give you this challenge today. Hello, homework assignment. Read Psalms 91 when you go home. Meditate on every verse and say, Lord, I'm going to meditate on that scripture, scripture after scripture, where you said that I'm in your refuge. I pray in your shadow, and you cover me with your wings, and I will lift you up from the dips and the pits of, of destruction. I will give you long life, and I will satisfy you. Hallelujah. Read that scripture, 91, and let it come alive in your heart. Let it come alive in your heart. Let us pray. Please bow your heads, close your eyes, and honor to the Father. Father, we come before your throne right now. We come before the foot of the cross. And Father, we ask you, Lord, to heal us. We ask you, Lord, to deliver us. We ask you, Lord, to bless us, O oh God. And Father, we choose you and all your benefits. And we renounce all time and fellowship with this world. We have no place in this world. And we renounce everything it offers. You have given us a choice, Lord, and we choose to be in covenant with you. We have reached the line of no return, and we will not look back. And every day we're becoming more and more like Jesus and further and further from this world. Our reality in Jesus is more real than our natural eye can behold. And we know that you're not a million miles away from us. You're right here with us. You're walking with us. You're talking with us. Oh, Holy Spirit, we have total confidence, Father, that you're with us in every situation that we face, every decision we have to make, every temptation that comes across our path. So, Father, give us ears to hear your instruction, eyes that will not be deceived, and our hearts that will remain faithful to you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen. Make up your mind to pray. Jesus' prayer life was not spasmodic, on again, off again. He was not too busy doing things like healing the sick and casting out devils. But he made time to pray. He made time to cry. And let me tell you this, when you go into your secret closet to pray, your secret tabernacle, and you come before the Father to pray between you and God, pray out loud, because there's power in the Word of God. Life and death is the power of the tongue. And let me tell you this, the last place that demons want to be is at a prayer circle. Because when you have a prayer circle, the angels of God are dispatched there, they surround you, and they Beat, get those demons, they beat them up, and they send them back where they belong, back to hell. There's power in prayer. Today I have a very good message for you. I want to talk to you about the key, five key elements that's going to help us learn about Jesus' personal prayer life. Five key essentials that's going to teach us to pray more effective, more dynamic for the kingdom of God. And this first key is found in Mark 135. Now in the morning, having risen a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place. And there he prayed. The first essential to a good prayer life is that Jesus found a time to pray. And therefore, he set a time to pray so that he could come into the presence of God and he could worship the Father. And that's what we need to do, to come into the presence of God and say, Father, we consecrate our life before you, Father. Reveal to us in our heart what we must do to become more like Jesus. Reveal in our heart what we must do to change, to be more like you, Father. Nothing separated Jesus from his prayer time. He was not too busy. He was not too, success too successful. He was not too active. He was not too busy doing things like healing the sick and casting out devils. But Jesus understood this principle. This principle that's very important for all of us to learn. He said, I need to spend time with Jesus, with the Father. I need a time of prayer. He understood that he, if he did not make deposits into the prayer bank, that when he prayed and wrote checks, 
they would bounce because the prayer bank would be empty. Our problem is that we write checks, prayer checks, throughout our day, throughout our week, but we don't make deposits into the prayer bank. But Jesus had time to pray. Everybody say, he had time to pray. Jesus had time to pray, and he spent time with the Father. In Luke 5.16, so he himself often drew himself into the wilderness and prayed. And Jesus' prayer life was not spasmodic. It was not on again, off again. It was regular. It was predictable. He had a specific time to pray, and often he would pray morning after morning after morning. So Jesus can stand before any king because he knelt before the king of kings, the Lord of lords. And Jesus could stand before any judge, before any powerful person, and he would not be intimidated because he had knelt before the God of the universe. And so Jesus, number one, he had a time to pray. And the Bible records in Luke 9, 18, and it happened as he was alone praying that his disciples joined him, and he asked them, saying, Who do the crowd say that I am? But notice that he was praying. He was praying. He was alone praying. Can I ask you a question? If Jesus, who is the Son of God, had a time to pray, don't you think you should have a time of prayer? Isn't church more than coming and sitting and going through another service? Isn't our relationship with Jesus supposed to be more than a weekend gathering? But really, when you want to grow, when you want to come alive, when you want to be exhilarated, you need to have a time of prayer. And nothing changed my prayer life when one day God gave me a revelation. And he spoke to me years ago. And he said to me, I want you to pray like this. Because I hit a time in my life where I got so busy with church work. I was a young father. I had young children. And my wife and I were just trying to deal with two little kids that were very high maintenance. And then I was, I was involved in the church. I was a Christian education director. I was an elder. I was a deacon. I, I was doing all kinds of church things, my wife and I. And then I was a police officer and working all that overtime and overtime. And then I had a part-time job. And then I was going to college at 12 units and getting straight A's. And pretty soon, prayer was in the back burner. I was no longer praying because I didn't have time to pray. And then all of a sudden, I hit rock bottom. All of a sudden, I was hit by lawsuits, lawsuits, hundreds of thousands of dollars of lawsuits from the police department, hundreds of thousands. They came up to a million dollars. Dep depositions, hearings, court fees, attorney fees, going to this hearing, going to that hearing, and they're trying to repossess my house, my car, my children. It was all bad. And then the next thing I know, they tried to, uh, they were investigating me for conspiracy to commit murder because of an officer ball shooting. And now they're investigating. They're trying to put me in prison for the rest of my life. And it was very stressful. I have a hard time talking about it because it just overwhelms me. It's just it's a tough time in my life dealing with the children, dealing with the church, dealing with going to jail, dealing with getting your house repo. And it wouldn't go away. It kept going on and on and on. And I didn't know what to do. And many of you have been in the same situation. You've been on your back. You had calamities happen to your life. And you know what I'm talking about. You've been there, and you can feel my pain. And it went on for year after year after year. It was a very tough time for me. But then Jesus spoke to me, and he said, I want you to meet me at this place. You have an appointment with Jesus, and I want you to be, keep that appointment. I want you to be there. I want you to come with me, and I want you to pray every day. And if you don't show up for this meeting, you'll be standing up the creator of the universe. And then it dawned on me, I was going to have a meeting with Jesus. I was going to have a meeting with God. And then God just gave me the revelation just about Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his purpose, and not by might, and not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. It was a tough time. But then I looked at Philippians, and it says, do not fret or have anxiety about anything. But in every circumstance, by prayer, with petition, continue to make your watch known to God. And God's peace will be yours. That peace that surpasses all understanding. It was a long journey. It, and then all of a sudden, 
God lifted me from the depths of the miry clay. He vindicated me. He promoted me. He elevated me. But it didn't happen overnight. It was years and years and years, four, five, six years that I had to go through this. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But Jesus was with us. Hallelujah. Then later on, I was talking, I became the president of the Christian Policeman Association, and, uh, and other officers were going through the same stuff, and I was able to pray for them. And they asked me, have you been where I've been? I go, yes, I have. And so I prayed with them, and God instantaneously helped them. And later on, I said, God, how come it happened instantaneously for all these people I prayed for, but with me, it took all these years? He said, my grace is sufficient. You've got to rest in my perfect peace. I'm making you better. I'm making you more. I'm a man of God. Jesus, number one, key essential from the prayer life with Jesus. He had a time to pray. Secondly, not only did he have a time to pray, but in Mark chapter 1, the same verse 35, he had a place to pray. He departed into a solitary place, and Jesus had a place to pray. And Jesus would often go into Jerusalem. He would go into the Olive Garden, and he would pray. He would pray scripture upon scripture upon scripture. He went to the mountains. He went to the fields. And he would pray, and he prayed, prayed. So I ask you, do you have a place to pray? What is your secret place that you go to before God and to pray? As for myself, I pray in my computer room. I pray in the patio. I pray in the car, in the room. Wherever I may be, I'm praying to God. And my wife promoted me to be king of the washing dishes. So when I wash the dishes, I pray to God. I pray to God all the time, amen, 24-7. And I pray for you, and I declare healing upon you. I declare health upon you. I declare prosperity upon you. I declare the love of God upon you. And every uh, first Saturday, every month, we pray at the prayer breakfast right here. And two weeks, we'll be praying. And I brought in some of my friends from Calvary Chapel to come over and to uh, join us in the prayer breakfast. And when they walked in, they go, whoa, we feel the spirit of God here. We feel the anointing over here. So I'll say this to everybody on TV land. If you want a healing, if you want a breakthrough, you want a blessing, you need to come to Calvary Assembly God Church because there's an anointing here. The Spirit of God is alive here. The people are filled with the Holy Spirit. They have signs and wonders here. You're going to be blessed. Calvary Assembly God. It doesn't matter who's preaching. It doesn't matter who's on the pulpit. But when you walk into the Calvary Assembly God Church, you know, buddy, there's a healing. There's a breakthrough. There's blessing. The Shekinah glory is at this place. You need a breakthrough, you need to be here. Hallelujah. And I invite all of you on two Saturdays to be at the prayer breakfast for signs and wonders. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then when I come before the Father, I say, Lord, as I pray for the body of believers of this church in different places, this has been a burden. And this is a burden, but now it's a victory. And then I record the victories. I say, thank you, Jesus, for answering that prayer. Hallelujah. You can pray anytime, you can pray any place, you can pray anywhere. You can play in a chair, a sofa, you can pray laying down, standing up, however God and you decide. And so, there I was. I was praying. I was praying in a, in a chair at 3 o'clock in the morning, and boom, I fell asleep. I go, that's not good. The next day, I changed it. I prostrated myself right on the floor, and I fell asleep again. I go, ooh, that's not good either. So the next day I came, and I started walking. And I was walking at 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm walking down, walking and praying. I go, this is working for me. I'm wide awake. This is great. So then the next day, I said, okay, I'm going to do it again. So I'm walking, and I'm praising God. Oh, hallelujah, how I love Jesus. And then I decided to close my eyes. And then I hit a furniture at a table, and it broke here. This table broke. And my, my wife, Philippa, got on the phone. 911, there's somebody breaking into the house. I said, there's nobody breaking the house. It's just David. He just, he's talking to Jesus. I can imagine the police department coming to my house, surrounding the house. This is the police department. Wait a minute, this is the reverend's house. This is the police department. Come out with your Bible in your hands. Oh, no, oh, no. Hallelujah. You can pray as long or as short. It doesn't make any difference. I know about a person, that, this young lady, she prayed for 12 hours a day. I know about a young man, he prayed 15 minutes a day, and he was out like a light. He goes, I had insomnia until I start praying. He worked it all out. He needs to change it around. He needs to change it around. I was at a prayer breakfast that we hold, and this 50-year-old gentleman comes up to me and he says this, that when he was 11 years of age, he was diagnosed with cancer. And so he went to the doctor. The doctor said, you have to take chemo. He goes, how long do I have to take chemo? He goes, for a long, long time. How long is a long time? He said, many years. He goes, I'm not taking chemo. The doctor said, we'll see about that. He goes back home. He says, Mom? I'm not taking chemo. I'd rather go to heaven than take chemo. So 
I want you to pray for me, Mom. The mother said, sure, I'll pray for you. But then the phone rang, and she's running out the door. He goes, Mom, Mom, come back. You forgot to pray for me. She goes, oh, yes. Uh, she ran back over there. She placed her hand on his shoulder. She said, be healed in the name of Jesus. And out she went. The next day, they went to the doctor. He tells the doctor, I don't need no more chemo. My mother prayed for me. I'm healed. God says I'm healed. Let's cancel this chemo. The doctor said, we'll see about this. Then the mother said, no, we want to run some more tests. They ran some more tests on him, and the cancer was gone. He said, you know what? We're going to take these tests every month for the next six months. And they took those tests, and the cancer is gone. God healed them. God healed them. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I heal it. So I asked you the question, how did he get healed? Did he get healed from his mother's faith? Did he get healed because of his faith? Or did he get healed because of God? Or all the above? I think it was all above. I read a story about a young girl, 11 years of age. She wrote a paper for school. And in this paper, she said, I want to leave a legacy. I don't want people to remember me that I was rich, that I was famous, that I made this invention or that invention. I want people to remember me as a person that told people about Jesus. I want people, when they see me, to say, there comes the Jesus girl. And when she went to school, she told everybody about Jesus. And she told people that Jesus loved her. And then when she became a ninth and 10th grader, she ran to all the students. And they go, here comes the Jesus girl. But she was beautiful. She was charismatic. She was bubbly. And they all listened to her. And then all of a sudden, she got in a car accident and she went straight to heaven. Several hundred people went to the funeral. One by one, they got up there and they said how she had impacted her life. And then they had the altar call. And at the altar call, they had 300 teenagers give their heart to Jesus Christ. 300. And those 300 people then told other teenagers. And they had a domino effect. And it kept going on and on and on. And what happened? She was building crowns of glory in heaven. And she got her prayer answered. She, that was her prayer request, and God answered her prayer. She left a legacy that will last from now to eternity. I read a story about an 85-year-old man that's a preacher. The board said, time for you to retire. He goes, I'm never going to retire. I'm going to retire when the rapture comes. So when Jesus comes, that's when I retire. I'm going to, I'm going to retire when Jesus comes. So the board said, okay, fine, stick around. And he stuck around for them several more years after that. And then when he got way up there in age, he was preaching at a funeral. And at the funeral, he came to the altar call. And he told everybody, are you ready to meet your maker? Unto each person, they have an appointment with death. Do you know you could be sitting down and you could be going to heaven? So I'm going to take a seat right over here. And I want you to ponder upon this for a couple of moments. And then when I get up, I'm going to ask you, are you ready to accept Jesus? So he took a seat. And then he sat down next to his associate pastor. And the associate pastor said, Pastor Paul, are you going to finish the sermon or what? And then Pastor Paul, I went to heaven. He goes, hmm, very interesting. So he comes into a congregation. Says, well, Pastor Paul said he might be going to heaven if he sat down. Well, folks, he just went to heaven. So I asked you, are you ready to accept Jesus? If you are, please stand. And everybody stood there. Everybody got saved. So the question is, are you ready to accept Jesus? Are you ready? And God is good all the time. Seek you first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, and all these things should be added unto you. The third thing I want to, to show you about Jesus' prayer life, number three, that he prayed out loud. This is so important to pray out loud. But don't misunderstand me. There may be sometimes that it might be inappropriate to pray out loud. Let's say that you're a computer technician, and you're on a semi line with about 50 people, and your computer breaks down. It's not a time for you to jump on the conveyor boat and say, let's have a prayer service right now. I'm pleading the blood of Jesus on this computer right now. Be healed, computer. Wrong, 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 wrong. Bad time, you're bad time. But let me say this, and this is big. It's never inappropriate to pray silently. You can pray silently anytime, anyplace, anywhere. But with that said, there's a secret to the prayer life of Jesus. Found in Matthew 26 and 39. He went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but your will be done. It said he prayed, saying. It didn't say that he prayed in his heart. He prayed in his mind. He prayed, saying. He prayed out loud. He had a place, a location, and he prayed out loud. There's power when you pray out loud. There is something that happens when a church prays out loud, and this church does that. There's power in this church. I've been to a lot of churches, folks, and they don't pray out loud. They don't do that. 
because they want to be politically, politically correct. But God said that we should be more reverent to God's house. And we should worry what Jesus thinks about it and not what man thinks about it. And I can remember hearing stories of moms and dads praying in their home, praying out loud, praying for their children, praying for their family. That's what it's all about, praying your, the gift of God over your family and over your children. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Well, I do that in my house. And when you do that, you create an energy, a, a synergy, allows for the Holy Spirit to come into the house and the blessings of God to be upon you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I'm depositing goodness and greatness upon my grandchildren so they can bless their generation upon generation. And that's why the disciples came to Jesus and said, teach us how to pray. And Jesus gave them the Lord's Prayer. But they didn't ask for the Lord's Prayer until they heard him pray. Let me ask you this. Do you pray out loud in your home? I don't think you're too ashamed because this is a praying church. So I have to suspect that everybody in this place, or most of you, do pray out loud. And when you pray out loud, you're blessing your home. You're blessing your children. And I know that you're not ashamed. And let me say this, even when you pray in your secret place, your secret tabernacle, pray out loud, there's power in the word of God. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. And the, the sound of the earnest, heartfelt, continued prayer of a righteous man makes tremendous power available, dynamic. And when you pray that prayer, demons have to flee because the angels of God come around and surround you. I'm telling you, when you start praying, God's angels come upon you, and your home is a sanctuary, a sanctuary of love, a sanctuary of protection. There's a hedge of protection upon it. You want your home to be protected? You want your children to be protected? You need to pray 24-7. Pray wherever you go and anoint your home with oil and plead the blood of Jesus Christ and cast out all the enemies and all the demonic forces. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Let's give Jesus a practice right now. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, God. We just love you. Hallelujah. Oh, there's power in the name of Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. There's power in the name of Jesus. Number four, you need a time to pray, a place to pray. Jesus prayed out loud. And he prayed by name. Luke twenty-two thirty-one, 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as we. Luke twenty-two thirty-two. 32. But I have prayed for you by name, that your faith should not fail. And when you have returned to me, strengthen your brethren. Jesus' prayer was not unspecific. His prayer was not general. He prayed out loud. He prayed for people by their name. He said, Peter, I have prayed for you by name. And the Lord told me to tell everybody at the sound of my voice that he's doing the same thing for you. You may be going through some challenges in your life. You may be facing some difficulties in your life. But the word is telling me and God is telling me that Jesus is praying for you right now. Jesus has you in his heart. He has your name on his lips. And he's not just praying general prayers like for the billions of people. He's evermore making intercession for you. He called you by your name because he knows that when Satan tries to take you out, like he tried to take out Simon, uh, Simon Peter, he has to dispatch the ministry angels of God to be encamped around you, to protect you. Jesus prayed for Simon by his name. Now I want to ask you a question. When Satan was asking for permission to sift Peter, who was he asking? When he said, I desire to have Simon Peter, who was he asking? Was he asking God? God would not give him. Was he asking Jesus? Jesus wouldn't give him permission either. So Bible scholars believe that Satan was asking evil angels to attack Peter. He was saying, I desire to sift this one as we. I want you evil angels, you fallen angels, you demonic forces to come over unto Simon, Peter, and I want you to destroy him. I want you to ruin his life. I sense that there's potential on him. I sense that the God's destiny is upon him. We need to take him out before he reaches that purpose. And he's calling all the hordes of demons to take out Peter. And he said, go to the hell, take all the demons, and go over there and take, demon, take Peter out and wipe him off the face of the earth. But here comes Jesus. And Jesus said, I'm going to pray for you by name, Simon. I'm praying for you by name, Peter. And it's not that you won't fall. It's not that you won't mess up. But you'll get up. And your grace, my grace will be upon you. And you will get up. And on the day of Pentecost, you will preach. And 3,000 people will come to know Jesus Christ. And I will start my church. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Satan studies the g and genetic code 
of his people. He studies our failures. He studies our children. He studies our children's children. And then all of a sudden, he sees all these people with potential. He goes, oh, that person has potential. That person has potential. They're all going to be doing things from God. And then he tells the demonic forces, go over there. Get them. Take them out. Take them out. But when you pray for your mother by their name, when you pray for your father by their name, when you pray for your wife by their name, when you pray for your husband by their name, when you pray for your daughter by their name, when you pray for your son by their name, then all of a sudden you have strength and power. And the grace of God covers you and protects you from all the forces of evil. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I want to ask you a question. Are you praying for your son every day by name? Are you praying for your daughter every day by name? Are you praying for your wife, your husband, your family every day by name? I can honestly say I do that. I pray for my children every day. I call them out by their name. And I call out many of you by your name. And then I say, Lord, I can't remember everybody. Just send your glory here. Just let the man, O God, be upon this church. And then everybody that walks into this church, that they be blessed. They be blessed with the glory of God. They be healed. They be have prospered. And life will be good for them. I call them out because I know there's power. There's power and power in prayer in the name of Jesus when you pray it out loud. First John 5 tells what happens when we pray. Now, this is the confidence we have in him when we pray, that we ask anything according to his will, he, that he hears us. And so, I ask you this. Is it God's will to save your family? Is it God's will to save your children? Is it God's will that your children make the right choices? Is it God's will that you right, marry the right person? Absolutely. So what am I saying? I'm saying that if you call out their name, it would be no more difficult for them to reject Jesus than to accept Jesus because they'll be bumping into God's grace. And the more they sin, more of God's grace is going to come in there. And the, you'll be like in a bumping car, and everywhere you bump, it's God's grace coming upon you. The more they sin, the more grace comes upon you when you call out their name in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Imagine this. They start to do something crazy. But all of a sudden, a mother, a father, somebody here, they drop to their knees. They come up before God. They say, Father, I don't know what's going on, Father, but... That name has come to my heart. Lord, do something. Intercede on our behalf, O Father. But what you don't know, but what you don't know, and listen very carefully to what I'm about to tell you, is that in the unseen world, all the angels of God are about the throne of grace. They're about the throne of God. And they're coming before Jesus. And they're telling Jesus, can I go now? Can I go now? Can I go and beat up some demons? And Jesus said, wait a minute. I hear a mother. I hear a father. I hear somebody praying for their son, their daughter. Go, 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 go. And the angels come. And they are around you. And they surround you. And all of a sudden, you start to do something stupid. And then all of a sudden, they put a restraining force on there. And they stop you. But even if you fall, even if you stumble, he'll pick you up. God's grace will pick you up and love you and say, I'm not finished with you yet. My grace is upon you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Don't ever start praying. Don't ever start praying for the the fervent effects your prayer of a righteous man is veileth much. There's a place to pray, a time to pray. Jesus prayed out loud, but there's something very powerful that's also found in Luke chapter 9. He took Peter, James, and John and went to the mountain to pray. And what is that? That's a prayer band. Because if one person can cause a thousand to fly, two can cause ten thousand to fly. And we become a corporate prayer together. We're sending 10,000 prayers to heaven. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. And he had friends and family that he would call this band together. But here's what's more powerful about that. In Matthew 18 and 18, As surely I say to you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Watch this. And again I say to you, that if two of you agree upon anything, it will be done by the Father in heaven. Because where two or three are together, there am I in your midst. And what do we have we have a band. We have a band. And so when you have two or three together, we have a band. And when you got a band, Jesus will come to you wherever you might be. He'll come to your office. He'll come to your job. He'll come to your funeral. He'll come to your church. He'll come to your home. He'll come to the hospital. With two or three, that's a band. And when you have that band, there's power. There's power because Jesus is there, and you can break. You can break all the strongholds. You can come into the, the presence of God, and you can say, Lord, heal them. Lord, deliver them. And your prayer is going to be heard. So here's what I'm saying to you. We need to form bands of five, five, five here, five here, that you pray for each other. Could you imagine? We'll get these bands of five in this church, a band of five here, a band of five here, in the community, in the state, in the country, and then pretty soon these bands throughout the world, they'll be that, that 
beacon and that light and that barrier against the evil of this world. We'll be able to stop all the evil of this world. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I want you to rise right now. I want you to stand to your feet. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Rise to your feet if you can, if you physically can. If you're not well, it's okay. And we're going to take this opportunity right now to start praying for our people. We want to pray for the members of our fast. I want you to lift your hands to Jesus. I want you to start praying run right now. I want you to start praying for your sons. I want you to start praying for your daughters. Just call them out right now. All over this room. Open your mouth. And let's just begin to pray the Father for just a moment. Come on, Father. Come on. Worship us. Let's turn the volume up. Let's hear your voices. Hear the Father in heaven. We're praying to the Father. Oh, we call on your name today, oh God. Oh, Father, we cry on you today. We pray for our families, oh God. We cry out today for our homes, dear Jesus. We cry out for you today, for our nation. We cry out to you today concerning all the natural disasters in America and in this world and for America. We cry out for you, O God. We humble ourselves before you and we kneel before the cross, O God. O Father, we pray, O God. We pray for your purpose in our life. We pray for fellowship with the Father. Father, we come before you. We say, let your kingdom be done. Let your will be done. O Lord, we pray out for those who are lost. We pray out loud for family members. We pray out for our hearts. Now just pray out loud for your family members. Call their names up. Call their names up to God. Call them out. And heaven will send a band of his squadron of angels that are waiting on reserve. And the moment you speak their names out, these angels are dispatched by God himself. Praise your hand to the Father. Call out your husband's name. Call out your wife's name. Call out your children's name. Your grandchildren's name. Oh, Father, we pray for our marriages. We pray for our families. We seek your face. Hallelujah. 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 <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. It's a time for the body of Christ to stand and be counted and let your prayers be heard in heaven. <clears throat> As America goes, so does the world. So that's why I'm asking the church to join me today in a three-day fast. Join me as we intercede for our families. Join with me as we intercede for our church. Join with me as we intercede for Pastor Gary and for Pastor Charlene, for Steve and Jamie and Jay Phillips. As Jay's going for this big election, we want to pray that he wins by landslide. Oh, Father, we come to you together, Lord. Oh, Father, we lift your head. Hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated. You may be seated. Okay, if you have written five things that you want God to do for you, I want you to stand up and lift your hands to Jesus. If you have five miracles that you want, lift them, put them in your hand, and stand up and raise them to the Father. And we're going to pray right now. Five big miracles. Something that only God can do. Do you have a big miracle that you want God to do for you? What may it be? Lift it before the Father. Let us pray. Father, we lift up our requests before you. We bring our petition before the Father in heaven. And God, you said that before we call upon you, that you would answer us and that you know what they are. We don't have to know, tell you what they are, God, because you know what they are. And Father, right now, we lift up our marriages. We pray for our relationships. We pray for our family. And we pray for our children. And so, God, we pray right now that you pour your love out into everyone that's here right now. And we pray, Lord, this love will be poured into their children and to their spouses. We pray, Lord, that you will grant them wisdom, wisdom to understand what they're going through and wisdom to understand what everybody else is going through. And we pray, oh, Father, that your grace would abound to them, that your mercy would flow through them, and that they'll walk in the light and not the evil way, Lord. And we pray, Lord, and we confess and declare that the spirit of the living God rests upon each and every person here with a spirit of understanding, with a spirit of love, with a spirit of knowledge, with a spirit of discernment and the fear of God. And we pray, Lord, that the spirit rests upon each and every person here today that you give them a quick understanding because you have declared them to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And we pray that no weapon formed against them shall prosper, Lord. And we pray, Lord, for a hedge of protection upon them, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that they'll be the head and not the tail, that they'll be above and not beneath, that they heed the commandments of the Lord your God and walk his way. And then when their enemies come against them, they should come in one way and flee seven ways. And you should pour out blessings upon them, O oh Lord. Oh, Father, we pray for the mighty blessing. We pray for each person here be blessed spiritually, mentally, physically, financially, and total social abundance. 
And now, Lord, we pray for a financial breakthrough for every person right now, God. And we pray according to 3 John 1 and 2. When you said, Beloved, I desire above all things that you be prosperous and good health, even as your soul prospers. So, Father, you want your people to be wealthy and healthy so they can be doing God's work, so they can bless themselves, their family, their church, their community in this world, oh God. And so we declare right now an explosive financial breakthrough in everybody's church right now. And now, God, we pray for jobs. And we pray for opportunities, oh Lord. Father, you said that promotion comes not from the east nor from the west, but from the Lord. And Father, we pray right now, as these people are looking for new jobs, new advancement, that you give them innovation, that you give them creativity, that you allow them to think outside the box, that you grant them great favor and great networks. And when they go for that job interview, Lord, that the human resources first say, I don't know why I'm choosing you, but God told me to choose you. And they'll come up to you and give you a bonus. We don't know why you're giving you a bonus, but you're getting there. And then we're giving you an elevator. They're going to promote them. We don't know why we're promoting you above everybody else, but we're going to do it. So, Father, we receive that blessing right now. We receive that blessing for your people to have good jobs. And they'll broaden their horizons, Lord. They'll broaden their horizons. And now, God, we pray for soulmates, for people that are looking for husbands, people that are looking for wives, people that are looking for friends. We just pray, Lord, that your spirit will bring that soulmate to them, Lord, and that the joy of the Lord will be there. We pray that they'll draw close to God, and God will draw close to them. And now, God, we pray for our church at Calvary Assembly of God Church at El Monte. We pray this church will be a lighthouse, a beacon unto this community, unto this country, Lord, and people will come in here, and there'll be signs and wonders and blessings. We pray for explosive financial breakthrough. We pray for workers, Lord. We pray for the hearts to come forth. We say a blessing upon everyone that walks in here, and they, will, and they will send out new teachers, new learners, new pastors from this church, oh God. And Father, we pray a special blessing on Pastor Gary, Lord, upon Charlene, Lord, upon Jamie and Steve and Jay, Lord. And we pray in the name of Jesus, Gary be healed. We say in the name of Jesus, Charlene be healed. Oh, Holy Spirit, we thank you. Amen, amen. Let's give the Lord a clap, Bobby, right now. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.